Welcome everyone to the uh, Healthy Aging and Care Network public seminar series. Uh, my name is Jason Danley and I am the uh, chair of the uh, Healthy Aging and Care uh, Research Network at Oxford Brooks. Um, so, uh, and now I get to uh, present a little bit about uh, my research that I've, I've been doing lately. Um, so I'm very happy uh, to talk about that um, with all of you. And hopefully we'll have uh, a bit of time at the end uh, to for discussion, for uh, any, any comments, any questions. Um, I've made this, I intentionally uh, sort of made this talk uh, less academic, less sort of technical um, than uh, a lot of talks I've been doing lately on these subjects. Uh, hopefully that works. Hopefully I don't slip into that um, by mistake, but um, I, I intentionally tried to frame it in terms uh, mostly of, of uh, what I think uh, sort of has resonated with a broader audience and, and hopefully uh, will resonate with some of you uh, tonight, uh, today. Um, so the title of the talk is Comparing the Experiences of Caring for Older Family Members in Japan and England, um, or Five Things I Learned from Working with Unpaid Carers of Older Adults. Uh, this was some work that I did that um, was uh, funded by, supported by uh, the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Uh, as well as from the um, John Templeton Foundation uh, Enhancing Life Project. Okay. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about me, about my research, about where this project came from and how I got into uh, looking at this issue of unpaid family carers. Um, I started uh, in 2005, 2008, I did this project uh, in Kyoto, Japan. Um, it's a wonderful, beautiful place. I got to know a lot of people there. But what I was really looking at in that project was about uh, growing older uh, in this context of the aging society. Uh, and I was really interested in how people make meaning uh, in later life. Um, so I ended up looking at the, the sort of religious, uh, and, and spiritual kind of rituals and practices. Um, and this ended up being a lot about grief and bereavement. Um, so I spent a lot of time um, with older people going to cemeteries um, and uh, talking about um, the kind of rituals and things they did there. Um, but one thing, uh, and that resulted uh, in uh, a book later on, which I'll mention. Um, but one thing they mentioned a lot was their concerns about who would care for them when they grew uh, older, uh, frailer, um, you know, if they got dementia, if they developed a disability. Um, and so there was a lot of um, sort of, you know, concern about that in an age where you have smaller families uh, and um, th those kind of past uh, uh, assumptions about family care uh, were growing a little bit um, more uh, precarious. Um, so there was all this concern about caregiving, and I wanted to know about the perspectives of the people uh, in the family uh, who provide care and what kind of concerns or what kind of, you know, uh, yes, concerns they had, um, and also the way that they made meaning out of their experience. Um, so in 2013, I got a chance uh, through the uh, JSPS uh, postdoctoral fellowship uh, to go back to Kyoto uh, and to do some research this time on the family uh, carers. Um, around the end of that bit, uh, I uh, published the, the research on that uh, first um, uh, project uh, in a book called Aging and Loss, Mourning and Maturity in Contemporary Japan. Um, but I wanted to keep on doing some research with the uh, caregivers. So um, I, I, I collected a lot of interesting stories, observations, uh, talked to a lot of different um, family carers in Japan. Um, but I thought this is such a, a global topic. There are family carers all over the world. Um, this might be uh, a topic that, that might really benefit from a kind of cross-cultural comparison. Um, so I had just 
moved to um, moved to England, started at Oxford Brooks, and I thought, why not talk to a few people who are caring for older adults uh, in England and see if anything comes out of that, um, and if there are any interesting comparisons that we might be able to make. Um, so uh, 2017 to 2021, uh, I was analyzing and writing up uh, all of this. And then finally, last year, uh, I published the book on that, um, that re research. Uh, and that was a book called Fragile Resonance, Caring for Older Family Members in Japan and England. Uh, and here's a little picture of the book. Uh, and uh, I, I was very pleased with it. Uh, it's still uh, mostly directed towards academics and to students who are interested in, uh, you know, topics related to care. Um, but uh, I also, I, the thing for me, the real value of, of the book uh, is the um, stories of the, the, the people who have uh, been doing care, um, their stories, their perspectives. Um, because I learned so much from this project, uh, and I hope that that uh, is, is conveyed in there. Um, I'm sure it's the strongest, most interesting part of the book for most people. Um, so while I was doing my research uh, uh, in Japan, um, of course, I was concerned with uh, the things, you know, that that carers worried about the hardships that they they had, the, you know, how they overcame those. Um, but uh, I started to hear a lot of people talking about how they grew and how they they learned from this experience of, of caring. Um, and one woman uh, said to me in an interview that there's nothing, nothing in life that you can learn more from than caring. Uh, and that really struck me as a story that maybe hasn't been told as much. Uh, at least in the kinds of, um, you know, research literature uh, about uh, informal care. Um, so I wanted to um, take that to heart and, and try to emphasize that as much as I could. Um, just for a little bit of background on Japan, there's about 7 million um, unpaid family carers of frail and disabled older persons in Japan. Uh, today. Um, Japan has one of the longest life expectancies and the highest proportion of uh, those 65 and older in the world um, at the time when I was doing my research. Uh, but now you have other countries in East Asia that are, are quickly catching up um, to Japan, especially South Korea, in terms of both longevity and in terms of the growing uh, population uh, of older people. Um, so this is a really important topic uh, in Japan. There's a lot of people affected by um, informal care. And uh, unlike the, the UK, where there is at least uh, a sort of, you know, uh, 2014 Care Act, uh, there is some kind of policy recognizing um, the, the needs uh, for carers to be cared for uh, and supported in some way. Um, Japan doesn't have anything like that. Um, they do have a system for uh, caring for older adults. They have a, a universal uh, long-term uh, health uh, and, and social care uh, system. Uh, and uh, that works pretty well for what it does, um, but it doesn't include uh, a coverage uh, for those who are uh, assisting or supporting uh, a, a frail or disabled older person um, in their family in this kind of unpaid informal way. So there's no carer's allowance or anything like that. Um, and uh, if you are, if there is an informal uh, carer um, in, in the household where, where um, there's a, an older person who, who has care needs uh, is living, um, they're likely to get a fewer um, kind of public su support or, or sort of uh, support through the long-term care insurance system. Uh, than if they lived alone. Uh, so it's assumed that if family's around, they are going to be doing care, but there is no um, care in the sort of system for those carers who are doing a lot of work. Um, so there's not a lot of recognition uh, officially sort of for them. Uh, at the same time, this is a system that really depends on uh, the labor of these uh, unpaid family carers uh, and, and 
you know, paid carers uh, were, were the first ones to acknowledge this to me. And when I talked to them, uh, one of them said the system as it is would not work if it wasn't for these family carers. And I think you could probably say the same thing uh, of the system here uh, in England today, uh, do a tremendous amount of work. Um, so uh, when I uh, moved to England after doing the work in Japan, uh, I was able to get one of these Enhancing Life Project um, uh, awards. Um, and the Enhancing Life Project, as it says here, uh, one of their aims is to investigate the, what are the forms of life uh, in which the enhancement of life takes place. Um, so I thought this was perfect because I am learning from, from carers and I'm seeing how it really does enhance their life to care. But of course, it enhances the life of um, all the people who, who want that kind of care as well. Um, so new questions came out of that. I was interested in um, right how, how universal these ideas of empathy or uh, attachment or affection were uh, in care of older family members. Uh, I was interested in how different kinds of institutional or social structures or policies were going to shape this kind of informal care sector. Uh, and of course, culture, values, tradition, meaning making, how do, how do these affect the relationships? Um, so those were the, uh, that was an interesting part of this uh, for me. Um, but today I'm gonna to focus on five lessons just to narrow it down. Um, and I'm gonna go through these Kind of quickly, I'm really going to try to emphasize the voices of the carers as I do this, uh, and really what what I learned from them. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep my commentaries um, to a minimum here. Um, but one thing when I, I uh, when I first came to to England and started to talk to uh, carers here, uh, one of the first things that I noticed uh, were was all the similarities. Um, that were um, there between the stories I was hearing in Japan, and the stories in England. Uh, and the first thing, the most prominent thing, I think, was uh, how caring can be exhausting. Uh, it is hard work. It, it was tiring. It was relentless. It was, uh, uh, right? Um, there were a lot of ways in which carers described this work uh, and the kind of fatigue um, that was a part of it. Um, but at the same time, um, there were ways in which it was also really meaningful. Um, so let me give you an example. There's, uh, this is from a, um, an English carer uh, who I was talking with. And he says, um, you know, I think it's really important that we ha all have the opportunity to, to go away and do other things because it's confining. And you, well, it's tiring in a strange way because because you can look at a day and think, I didn't do much today because everything, and then he turns to his mother that's in the room. Mom, this is a frustration, isn't it? Because everything takes quite a long time. And his mom says, oh yes, and I'm sick and tired of it. Right, so you're not doing a whole lot in the day. Things just take a long time and then, that's exhausting, that kind of uh, pacing uh, of care and being with the other person in that pacing can be exhausting, even though you're not doing a whole lot. Uh, a Japanese carer, uh, a, a woman who's taking care of her, her mother um, said, oh, I couldn't sleep. My mother was next to me and I would always be hearing her saying, ooh, ooh. It really felt like I was just hearing the devil's voice. It was excruciating. I would say, what's wrong, mom? But all she would do was moan. And then she couldn't eat food. And I'd say, what's wrong? And all I could do was just rest my hand on her body or hold her hand. And I'd be like, what should I do for her? But it was like that every day when I was caring. I felt like I wasn't sleeping, even when I was sleeping. So this exhaustion, I could really feel it in that story. And um, also the, the kind of constant vigilance uh, and the constant worry and wondering if I'm 
doing the care in the right way? And, and is, it, is it good enough? Is this what they want? Um, so there was a, a mental and emotional exhaustion, uh, not just a physical exhaustion. Um, in both of these cases, though, um, the, the, the carers were, I thought, very, uh, very uh, affectionate, very empathetic, uh, and they were excellent carers. And, um, and they also uh, recognized this, the way that they became more sensitive to uh, the person they were caring for. Um, and uh, gradually over time, uh, how that developed in them was something they found very meaningful from this experience of care. The second lesson was to really appreciate some of the simple moments. And this could mean moments in care um, where something happens that sort of picks up your spirits a little bit. Um, it, it could even be just a, a short phrase or, or a look or uh, something like that. Uh, but there were also simple moments that people appreciated when they were able to step away from the care for a moment and, and sort of catch the breath, right? And again, this was something that I saw um, it, it, to some extent amongst both Japanese and English carers. Um, so care was something that, um, that slowed the pace of life down a little bit, um, maybe um, in a sense sort of focused people a little bit, but, but it made them uh, quite present. Now, one of the things that, that really a lot of carers spoke about as, as being um, very stressful um, was not being able to sort of plan for the future, not being able to know what was gonna happen, where you're gonna be at um, you know, a week from now or something like that, not being able to make plans and not knowing if you're gonna be able to show up for uh, an occasion or not, because things were constantly changing. And, uh, and you were constantly uh, needed in a way. Um, on the other hand, um, there were moments where staying present was, uh, was really a gift. Um, okay, so this is a Japanese care. And she said, on Sunday, my older brother would come over for three hours and I would go to this gyoza restaurant that I uh, love and I'd eat and then I'd have a cup of coffee. And then I go back home and switch places with my brother. That Sunday, once a week, that rest was so important. And then once again, when Monday began, it would be the same thing all over again. Um, so I think that uh, sometimes we might underestimate the importance of these small moments. Even a few hours uh, can be so restorative for, for some carers. Uh, and, and a simple thing like going out to a restaurant by yourself and, and catching your breath a little bit. Um, this is an English woman I, I spoke to who was able to get a few days of, of respite care. Uh, and she went away to a place that was as remote as she could possibly get. Um, and says, for the first two days, I just sat. I did nothing. And then the two days just went. I just wasn't able. And I think that's the stage people get to. There's so much that you're dealing with is that when you haven't got to deal with it, You've got no energy for anything. But for her, she really enjoyed these two days of just doing nothing uh, and uh, not being in the midst of all that. Um, and uh, so she says she doesn't have the energy, but she also says she really enjoyed it. Um, and this is another Japanese care. Uh, she said making food was the hardest part. Um, since uh, her, her mother couldn't hardly eat anything, uh, I had to really think about how to present the food that she would enjoy and the way the colors went together and the textures and so forth. But when she could eat all the food, I would feel so refreshed and able to keep going. Um, so something very simple, eating all the food. Um, simple, but uh, you know, obviously for this woman, took a lot of thought, took a lot of work, took a lot of care. Uh, and she really put her heart into it. Um, but these very ordinary kind of moments uh, were also very meaningful. So appreciate those moments. Uh, third lesson was you can't do it alone. Uh, this I heard many times, again, both from um, Japanese carers and from 
from uh, English carers as well. Um, so this is a group of women I spent, I spent a lot of time with uh, uh, in Japan. Um, this was a, a group of women who lived in the same neighborhood uh, and formed a kind of informal support group for each other where they would get together uh, and um, have a little meal together. Uh, this was at a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant um, and, uh, and just talk and, and support each other. Um, and it was a wonderful group. They had a great time together. Uh, although sometimes, you know, the stories that they shared were were quite um, quite serious and, uh, and and heavy. But amongst themselves, um, they were able to get um, some some advice, some some relief, some hope, uh, and it was uh, absolutely vital. So although there isn't a whole lot of formal support in the social care system in Japan for unpaid carers. Um, there are a lot of the, uh, there are uh, many uh, sort of informal ways in which people get together to support each other. Uh, and I think that was absolutely crucial. Uh, I also spent a lot of time with uh, a group uh, in Japan that was uh, for men who provide care, specifically for men who provide care. Uh, most of them were providing care to spouses or to um, parents. Um, but, but again, Having that space in a very informal way um, was really vital uh, for them uh, to, to keep their spirits up and um, uh, to, to, again, share information, share advice. Um, in, uh, when I came to England, I noticed that there were many, many more uh, support groups for, for carers, uh, which uh, I think is wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of services um, that you can uh, easily find um, to, to help support uh, you or connect you with these kind of um, peer support networks. Um, so that's really valuable. So this, there are ways in which this can be integrated into the more uh, formal uh, support system um, or in conjunction with um, the, the kind of nonprofit sector or the, the sort of third party organizations. Uh, in Japan, however, it's very uh, informal stuff. All right, lesson number four, uh, levitate. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, this is Kimiko Nishimoto. She's a photographer that um, makes these very sort of irreverent, uncanny kind of photographic uh, pieces. Um, this is one of her praying uh, at the uh, Butsudan, at the Buddhist altar in her home, uh, where her husband's there in the photo. Um, she's levitating in a way. Um, but what I mean by levitating, I mean is sort of being able to get a bird's eye view of your own situation, being able to step back a little bit and seeing your situation in a, in a um, much more um, broader viewpoint was really important for carers, again, to, to give um, some perspective. It's very easy to get very narrow and very focused and very um, much in a sense of isolation. Um, but carers really emphasize this, um, this idea of, of, of levitating, of getting a different view. Um, so uh, one carer said, the worst is not being able to see what will come next. Life's just a moment. So when I think that these three years have been so long, uh, it doesn't seem like only a moment, but if I think about that, I, I really feel like I'm given this sense of vastness, um, right? Um, that gives me courage. I'm so grateful to all those, those people, those spirits that I cannot see who are watching over me. So this was a woman who had, um, a, you know, a kind of spiritual uh, faith, um, and that helped her to see her own situation in the context of this vastness. Um, and uh, that included, you know, not only sort of a vast uh, amount of time or something like that, but also uh, in the sense of uh, all of these other spirits and all of these, you know, past people from her family and everything. And to see herself as sort of continuing in that line was something that was really meaningful for her and helped her adjust. Um, Another carer said, I felt, how do you say it? I had more of a, an appreciation for the feelings of others. In Japanese, this is often called omoyari. Well, I don't know for sure, but of course it's hard. Sometimes you don't know if that other person, what that other person's feeling, or you feel like it's not really getting through. So doing care is hard. 
but being the person cared for is also really hard. So this person really emphasized not only thinking about, when they get thinking about their own feelings and how hard it was for them, they would get really discouraged, but when they would start to think about, well, it's actually harder for this person that I'm taking care of, um, that helped him to um, get a little bit of perspective, right? Sort of see himself from the other point, person's point of view a little bit more. Okay, uh, the last one, lesson five was dance your relationships. And this comes from a woman I met in Japan uh, who was trained as a dancer and applied some of what she uh, learned from dance uh, to her experience as a carer. Um, so she said, maybe since I was a dancer, I understand that maybe I should do it this way or maybe this other way would feel better. I just have to adjust because I'm not always feeling great. And if your mood's going up and down all the time, that's not good at all. So it's incredibly offensive to the other person. So even on stage, you think, I want my body to go this way. And then from the audience perspective, it might not appear that way at all. So um, it's kind of hard to see just from this, but uh, she was very conscious of the way she was moving, the way that was connected to her emotions, uh, and then the response of the other person that she was taking care of. Um, and I guess she was levitating in a way, taking the perspective of, um, you know, uh, uh, an audience in a way, uh, a sort of third party, how that would seem. Um, but I like this uh, notion of, of, of being flexible and constantly adjusting, and that for her was really uh, important, and to be responsive to the other person, um, which you have to be if you're dancing together and you don't want to step on each other's toes. Um, right, so those are uh, the five lessons in a nutshell, uh, what some of the things that I got out of this. Um, I know I didn't talk too much about the nitty gritty of policy differences and institutional differences, or um, not too much about cultural differences, although I'm happy to talk about that more uh, when we have our uh, discussion later. Um, but uh, that's all I wanna to talk to. If you are a carer and you are seeking support, if you're in the Oxford area, uh, Carers Oxfordshire uh, is a wonderful service um, and uh, they have lots of support resources. Um, if um, you think it's a little bit more serious and you need help, there's the NHS Carers Direct Helpline there as well. Uh, if you'd like to follow up with me, I'd be happy to hear uh, uh, about your uh, perspectives. Um, you can follow me. Um, there's some information there um, about my website, um, Twitter, and email. Um, yes, uh, and I think at this point, I'm happy to um, open up the discussion. Um, let's see. Uh, I will maybe stop the share so I can see everyone a little bit better. Great. Um, I think, uh, Ben, are you able to um, keep an eye on the chat for me in case things pop up there? Yes, yes, certainly Ready? will. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. So if you, uh, if you can, you can use the raise hand function and we can uh, call on you. Um, or uh, if, you have, if you'd rather use the um, meeting chat, uh, you can do that to write your question. And I see a hand from Hugh. Hey, Jason, thanks so much Hi, for Hugh. the chat. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm coming from UCL's Digital Anthropology Program, looking at uh, kind of starting on my dissertation work, looking at how technology is used to care for those who live with dementia. And I'm just curious from your perspective in this, both of these field sites, where either digital technologies or like online groups of support kind of came into the fray, if that did come up at all. But I'd, I'm curious to know if there's any like experiences or stories that you heard of of the utilization of like social media different like alexas kind of stuff like that anything like that be really curious to know yeah no um thank you hugh for that um i i think this is an area of real interest i i um 
So my field work for this was all pre-pandemic stuff. And I think that maybe has sort of like kicked off a lot of people, you know, using these um, uh, sort of online digital resources to, to connect with each other. Um, and, uh, but uh, for my project, that, that still wasn't a very uh, popular thing. You know, it was very um, analog in a way, that world that people were living in. And even in people's homes, um, there was very little um, technology that was sort of there. Um, you know, a few times I would spot someone with one of these sort of call buttons, you know, emergency call button kind of things, or, you know, that on a lanyard or something. But uh, that was um, about the extent of it. I think in one case, or in a couple of cases, there were um, uh, people who had maybe a, a kind of mat next to the bed of the person they were taking care of so that they would get, um, they had a sensor in it so that they would know if the person got up and stepped on the mat, if, you know, so that they could be alerted. Um, uh, and these were uh, in cases where the person who was the carer was living in the same house as, as the person who was being cared for. Um, so it wasn't a, a remote kind of thing. So I know in Japan, there's, there are a lot of technologies or interest in technologies for um, family members who maybe are not living together with the person that they're caring for, um, just so that they can monitor some things like that maybe. Um, and and I, I think that's um, pretty interesting. But no, I didn't hear too much about carers getting together online. And I, th I thought that was, um, I think that's that's quite interesting. I, I'd like to know if that's happening more. I think it was really important for, uh, really meaningful for the carers to get together, but it was hard sometimes because carers are busy. Um, they're really busy. And so some of them, some of the folks at these meetings for, for supporting carers would say, well, I, you know, I couldn't go to this, you know, until, uh, you know, I was able to arrange all this care for, for the person I'm caring for. So it's, it's very hard. And a lot of people are just too, too busy and too overwhelmed. So um, those in-person meetings, although they're very meaningful and very you know, uh, important for people, um, they are really difficult for some people, maybe the people who need it most to get to. So I, I hope that there is more maybe use of that. And if anyone here has any other experiences with that kind of care, um, I'd be happy to, for you to share your experience and jump in. Thanks you for the thank question. You. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, Rhonda. Hi, thanks, Jason. Um, I, I sort of thought to myself, your, your main themes there, nothing completely surprising. Um, my reference point is, is a dissertation I did, gosh, it's 10 years ago now. <laughs> um, but I wasn't interviewing, you know, family carers, sort of informal carers in that way. I was... Uh, interviewing um, domiciliary carers employed by agencies on the main and and focusing on communication but I mean obviously in your interviews you get a lot of other feedback as well and the themes of you know exhaustion and so on really really quite important and and I think it's just sort of so overlooked in you know uh, in the sort of role that carers have to play just to you know keep things together um, so I just wondered if you came across anything about sort of the way they coped and things they did to cope, things that they changed about their behavior to cope with their caring role. Uh, if there's anything you wanted to say about that, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, so I began this um, project, uh, I think it was thinking mostly about um, I, I, in a very sort of academic sense, I guess, I, I was looking at something called uh, sense of coherence coming out of Antonovsky's work uh, on sense of coherence. And I was reading work that was saying that having this sense of coherence, right, having a worldview um, that, uh, that allows you to um, deal with uh, sort of unexpected things a little bit by fitting it into a sort of uh, meaningful worldview for, for yourself, a, a coherent worldview in a way, 
um, uh, understanding you know things that come your way in terms of that um, was uh, really helpful for for carers was was helping them become more resilient right um, and was a better predictor of um, you know, sort of your level of, of sense of coherence was a better predictor of exhaustion and things like, you know, how much sleep you were getting or, you know, the severity of symptoms of dementia or the, the person you're caring for. So it seemed like a really important thing. You know, people were able to, um, to do the work of care uh, and find it meaningful, um, then they were much, uh, uh, it was much easier for them to, to sort of, I guess, cope um, uh, in those, I don't know if I use that word, but, um, <laughs> adjust and respond uh, and um, and then uh, you know find some um, find those happy moments too and those really meaningful moments um, so um, it's in I think what I think is interesting is that there there it wasn't so much the the behaviors or the kinds of care that they were giving that was changing uh, as much as it was people's um, Sort of mindsets and their their emotions and uh, things like that. And sometimes this was really sudden, uh, and sometimes it was gradual. Um, but uh, I think uh, so. I, I'm really I think the most sort of vulnerable time um, for most of the, the cares that I spoke to was sort of early on in the care, right? Not because uh, the, the tasks were much harder then or something. Indeed, someone's, you know, um, you know, symptoms or disability might sort of become more advanced as they go along, but because the person wasn't yet sort of used to that kind of care and there were still a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, sort of mental and, and emotional exhaustion that was going on, um, that was uh, re really difficult for the person. Um, so then it would take some time. Um, and this seems to be supported by some of the literature on, um, you know, uh, cases of abuse and so on that happen um, from carers to the person they're caring for. Um, that it's those those early you know, year or two that are that are the most difficult. But um, yeah, I um, so in one in one instance, um, there's a, a woman uh, in Japan who'd been caring for her. Um, it was a mother-in-law, um, and she found it really difficult. Her mother-in-law was living with dementia. Uh, she uh, also was was prone to sort of leave the house and and sort of get lost um, a lot and be brought home by the police. And this was very stressful for the family because they didn't want to have the police car out front again. Uh, and um, I think it was really stressful for her to be living uh, and caring for this woman. Um, and then she talked about. Uh, a time when there was a big, in a nearby city, there had been a big earthquake and she had gone with some other people uh, to the site to, to help with the recovery of the earthquake. And then she said, after that experience, she started to look at her own experience of caring for her, her mother in a totally new way. Uh, and it became much easier and she became much more um, uh, sort of empathetic and, and sort of close to, to her. Um, and uh, I, I found it striking. I mean, the care was still very similar, um, but uh, somehow that experience had changed her, her mindset about it, and she became a little bit more open to it. Um, so the book, Fragile Resonance, is really about how people come to sort of change their, their mindset about things um, more than anything else. Some people had certain religious or spiritual kind of um, beliefs or faiths, uh, and oftentimes these were strengthened or deepened uh, as they um, were giving care. Um, so something that you might be interested in, <laughs> probably. Um, but uh, again, that wasn't so much about, you know, a change in their behavior so much as, um, a, a, you know, a different sense of, you know, a, a power greater than themselves or a greater sense of spirit and what that means, or connection to others. Um, and so it was very much these sort of internal resources that were, that were changing and shifting. Does that make sense? Thanks. Um, Bev, hi Bev, great to see you. Uh, I see your um, comment in the chat. Um, 
Is that right? If I just read it, because I think it's a good comment. Um, you wrote uh, that you wrote an online WordPress blog about caring for your husband uh, and uh, shared it on Facebook. And it was really therapeutic um, to write that and also informative and helpful. And I believe other care uh, for other carers to read. Yeah. Um, and I think that is great. And you're also a wonderful writer. And and uh, <laughs> I think, you know, <laughs> I, I love to, uh, you, that you did that while you were whilst you were caring, you know. Do you want to say anything more about that? It was my daughter's actually that encouraged me to do it. Mm. As I said, if you put things down in writing, mom, it's like it lifts the weight of all the, the care from you. And you can share it with other people who'd find it fascinating because they're in the same, either in the same position or they don't understand what dementia is, you know, and they've got older parents or husband, wife, whatever. Uh, and I did get some really nice comments back from people saying how they found it a really, really insightful because they hadn't been able to find anything to explain things to them. And because it was all be, it was stuff I'd already experienced and had to find my way through it, it was my take on it, but they understood it because it was you know, a lay person rather than a, a nurse or somebody telling them um, how to go about things. So yeah, it did make me feel a lot better. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And I'm um, so, so happy you did that. I had, had a lot of I really enjoyed that. I, I think um, I, I didn't uh, I didn't meet many um, carers who did something like that, who did that that kind of writing um, in that way, and um, it was mostly just sharing with with people face to face conversations and things like that. Um, so I think that's really unique and special. Um, and, and we do get so much out of it. And I, I found in these peer support groups that, you know, everyone had a different story or different situation or, you know, had a different kind of dementia or something like that. All, all those, you know, differences were there. But it was just so good for people to listen to other people's experience, even despite these differences, right? Um, and to help them to, to see their own story in a different way. Yeah, yeah. I think going to groups is good because you get to meet people. A lot of those people don't have the confidence to to approach somebody and you know ask for an explanation or even even the non, non not te technology be minded they, don't, they haven't got a computer or access to media or whatever they don't understand how it works it, it and because it's it tends to be older people who get these problems it, it's lost really on them as you know how do you reach out to people um i had a really sad um experience myself my daughter had a friend at work whose dad was going through something similar with his, his own wife and he had no one to talk to and she said do you think you could phone him and talk to him mom because you've gone through this you know something similar and it really I did talk to him twice actually but it just struck me how scary it is for people when it's a brand new experience thrust on them and they're older they're not able to as I say not able to tap into things to find help Mm -hmm. And I just thought some of the things he was doing were really dangerous, like leaving his wife on her own in a car when he went shopping and that sort of thing, you know. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> and this poor guy was in Birmingham, so he's not on the doorstep. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a big, it's, it's, it's an area where there's not a lot of access to, to learning. I've, I've made a point of finding courses to do to explain it to myself what was happening to him. You know, so I could understand better and cope with it better. There's so many people don't understand even that they're available. You know, there's a big gap in in the care system where you, people are you know, given pointers to find stuff out that makes a difference in your everyday life. So if you can't find it, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a real good point. Thanks, Bev. Um, I see a hand from Tomo. Hello. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your uh, sharing this uh, talk. I'm very, I found it very interesting listening to you all. Um, I'm, I'm Japanese, and you can guess from my name, and yeah. and uh, um, and I'm a doctor too. I work in Exeter. Um, mm -hmm. My Specialty areas uh, um, is geriatric medicine, so uh, looking after all the frail, frail all the people basically in 
in in our locality um and yeah just hap i just happened to find this uh, your talk through looking for um age friendly city uh, you know such and uh -huh. I, I kind of thought when when i saw your topic of japan and england comparison like mm -hmm. oh that's that's very interesting <laughs> um i have a couple of questions um uh, um one of them is uh, that who do you speak Japanese and who, who did you interpret for these carers in Japan? Because uh, language is a big barrier, I suppose, uh, for Japanese um, uh, uh, people. Um, and then also second one is uh, um, what was the kind of main difference you find in their caring approach or um, say their mindset of caring between Japan and England? For example, I guess Japanese families or carers are maybe more trying to keep their um, parents at home than more than England. That that's my guess, but I might be wrong um, because of all cities and more urbanized in Japan, maybe more difficult, of course, to do that. And uh, and then third one is a uh, some sort of a kind of what is the next step for future? Are you trying to do something more expanding this or um uh, doing some other project or something to like you know yeah that, that's a free question sorry I'm giving you lots Thanks of questions lot, Tomo. <laughs> no those are great questions um I mean for the first one it's very I I speak Japanese I did the, the um, interviews in Japanese uh I had I hired people to do the transcription for me um uh to help me out with that so uh most of the transcription was done by uh, others, um, uh, Japanese um, uh, uh, native speakers, um, and uh, but I did all I conducted all the interviews and and everything uh, myself uh, in Japanese. So uh, yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that was really important um, uh, to to catch those nuances in language. Uh, one of the things that struck me uh, as very different uh, after a while was that, um, and this again, this was not the case across the board. I, it just seemed to be uh, after I had uh, spoken to a few um, uh, carers in England, what struck me a little bit was the difference uh, in the ways they described care. So there were, um, in Japan, a lot of the, um, as you say, a lot of the carers were uh, living together with the person they were caring for. Uh, and that was more common in Japan. Um, but um, uh, not only that, but they also spoke a lot about um, the, the importance of, of touch, uh, the importance of being close to the person, physically, bodily, you know, close to the other person um, to sort of get us uh, to be able to feel what they're feeling, right? Um, there was that... Um, woman in the, uh, the, I read her comments about sort of touching her mother's hand uh, to calm down, right? Or, you know, sleeping next to her, things like that. And this was very common in Japan and most carers um, spoke of this in a very sort of positive way. Um, whereas I, there were very, very few English carers who had similar ways of talking about the person they were caring for. Um, and there were a few who, who felt very uncomfortable about doing that kind of personal care, um, things, bathing, feeding, or changing, uh, those kind of things. Um, a lot of the sort of physical tasks that Japanese carers spoke about a lot as something that could help them sort of cultivate a sense of empathy. Um, the English carers would prefer to um, have a, a professional um, that would handle those. Um, and um, so their sense of duty or their sense of what what care was was about you know making sure they were getting the best person in for the for the job right and and that that kind of quality or expert care um, to to help them um, and uh, in that way they they felt that they were being a responsible family member um, and not just a carer. Right, so they thought, saw a family member and carer as somewhat separate, um, and this was especially so for people caring for all, older parents. I would say um, spouses were a little bit different, right? Um, but uh, that was a that was kind of a big difference. I think one of the reasons why you had this closeness in Japan 
um, was because there are different ideas uh, in Japan about um, sort of com nonverbal communication uh, and, and about closeness, perhaps skinship, things like this, um, but also uh, notions of compassion um, and uh, um, you know, coming out of, of, of Buddhism and other kinds of things that were very much about you know, breaking down that barrier between the self and the other. Um, and um, yeah, so <laughs> those are some of the things. As far as what, what's happening next, uh, um, that is a, um, um, I looked at people who were taking care of family members, and now I'm looking at older people who don't have any family members to take care of them and what they do. So I did a project in Japan about people who were estranged from their families. Um, and how they find care, um, or don't, <laughs> as is often the case. Um, but I'm, I'm sure I'd be really curious. I'm sure I have lots of questions for you and, and what you found as, as interesting differences, but I'll have to follow that up later because I see um, you has a, oh, hi, I'm sorry. Hi, Wickham has a, <laughs> has a question. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Jason. Um, my name is Paul Gilliam, as you can see. I'm actually uh, used to work for Oxford Brooks internationally, mainly. <laughs> oh, hi. But some time ago. Anyway, um, I thought Tomo's questions were really good to you and cover some of the points I wanted to raise, really. First of all, can I say your experiential type of research, I think, is absolutely spot on to go and do it the way you've done it. So that's the first thing. But uh, secondly, um, do we not face very different cultural and ethnicity issues in, in England and the UK compared to Japan? I mean, we haven't had, or you have, but Japan, as I understand it, hasn't had the um, influx of refugees from different ethnicities in the same way that Europe has and, and the UK in particular, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, when I was doing my own research, which was in the educational area, looking at differences in the way uh, students uh, regarded UK qualifications as um, when they went back home. Have we not got the same sort of thing here that um, we're just growing into something that we've become familiar with over time? And that is going to vary enormously as we go forward. And I wondered whether a study in England between different ethnic groups, uh, I think, or automatically in Indian, for example, yeah. would be very, very interesting because it's very difficult for people to understand these things. Uh, coming back to uh, Bev's point, I think it was, about um, availability of information, what I tend to do now, as it says on the screen, is I work for, well, uh, on U3A, which is um, older people, and we've got 30 groups of older people, and what the sort of thing you're talking about comes up very, very regularly. These are older people who are going to need care themselves in the not-too-distant future, perhaps. And um, they are very worried, as you've indicated in your comments, about how exactly that's going to be manifest to them now compared to, for example, their own situation when they were the carers, because they can see that their children are working internationally or in jobs and not, not living near them and so forth. And, and I agree totally with, I think it was Beth, uh, that, you know, there doesn't seem to be that input from the so-called, and I may be wrong here, uh, totally wrong, and Rhonda may put me right, I think, uh, from the caring charities to disseminate that information more widely. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, great. A lot of great points in, in there. Um, um, I'm trying to um, think of all of them together, but I, um, okay, I'm sorry. What was, what was the, the question right before? Ethnicity differences. Ethnicity differences, yes, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think it would be uh, uh, wonderful. In fact, there, there have been um, some studies that I've come across of, of this in um, uh, people looking at uh, particularly South Asian groups, Bangladeshi and uh, um, um, yeah, Indian Pakistani uh, groups, uh, and their um, uh, and and um, uh, this informal care uh, system, right? So I know there's some people that have looked into this. Um, and done some of that sort of more qualitative work, um, you know, getting people's contacts and their stories. Because I do, I do, I think you're right. That is important in this, and to bring forward their voices. Um, uh, 
but uh, um, that, that's true. These, these things are changing. Um, and uh, I think in general, as you say, I think it's, it's important that we um, have, more, have more public conversations about this and more, um, uh, I think, uh, discussions about it. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think uh, I, there's that question of, you know, um, family care versus, uh, you know, paid care. And, you know, in a very sort of developed welfare state like Denmark, where it's just all sort of the state, then it's all sort of paid care, right? And it's all sort of provided there, almost to the extent where they're, they're really kind of discouraging family to get too involved in the, in the elderly care, um, yeah. you know? That that's sort of one model, right? And I can see how you know there could be some uh, advantages of that for some people in some contexts. But I also saw so many people who wanted to, to provide care, who, who found it meaningful, whose lives were changed by it. Um, and what they really needed most was, you know, as, as Bev said, more information, more support, more you know, sort of you know that kind of thing. Um, and I think there's just a tremendous amount of, of sort of, um, I don't know, uh, 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 resources, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, here, uh, you know, uh, people who want to care, who have a genuine uh, care and interest in doing that. Um, and if we can find ways to, to support them, um, you know, that can be um, a, a huge benefit to, to society as a whole. So I think that um, that was the message that I kind of came away with. But if you don't support them, they get burned out, you know, or they have to leave their job and, and then they're, you know, there's money issues and they're stressed as well. Um, and there's all kinds of the sort of domino effect of things that, that could happen. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the real tragedy is you have people that <laughs> could be, um, you know, really wonderful carers and really developed through that. Um, but we're not catching them at the right time, not getting them the right information. Um, and uh, I think that um, you're right, that that kind of has to be more normalized. Care has to be sort of something maybe that's a little bit less, I don't know, stigmatized or, or you know, uh, it should be something that we're, we're just talking about in a much more natural way. Well, I don't expect you to make any comments on what I'm going to say, but to some extent, uh, it comes from the post-war 1947 socialism, you know, the introduction of the welfare state, and you mentioned Denmark, which is very similar, of course, some of the background in, in a sense. Uh, it never quite ceases to amaze me how it's sort of slightly so different in Japan. But thank you very much. That's very, very Thanks. interesting. Oh, Thanks a lot. Yeah, <laughs> we could talk a lot about this. Um, I think we've come to the end. I don't see any new questions in the, in the chat or any raised hands, but we've come to five o'clock. Thank you all again. Uh, for coming to this talk and for your wonderful